the island of Oahu to fly to Hawaii and see for yourself this land of tropical you have heard it is a land of eternal summer pineapples and sugar cane on a luxury liner now suppose that your dream does come true you have arrived in Honolulu what will you find First, welcome as a visitor. Next, you may be a bit surprised to find that Honolulu, American. The streets look the same as they do in any prosperous city on the mainland. There's the same constant flow of busy people and bustling traffic. The people who live here look very much in any large American city where there are many races, and Puerto Ricans, and all the Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese. You see office buildings that could just as well be. However, the federal government building reminds us of culture by the missionaries who built. They sailed to Orne to bring the word of God and a new way of life to the Polynesian people. Today, Honolulu's library is filled with the history of early settlers, governments, Asian kings. The museum houses proof of a highly developed Polynesian culture. Some of the old historical buildings in Honolulu serve two purposes, as a link to a colorful past and as additional housing for objects of historical interest. Dating three, the old printing house reminds us that American culture ends well over a century ago. One building almost everyone has heard about is the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It sits on the shores of the world-famous Waikiki Beach, the most famous vacation spot in the world. Sunny skies, sandy beaches, and a warm, friendly ocean make this a perfect place for a happy holiday. Even small children love the tropical warmth of the ocean. It's easy to see why Hawaiian kings called Waikiki their home. Surfboarding is not new to Hawaiians. It was they who discovered and perfected the art. Perhaps the long rolling surf of Waikiki was the inspiration. Whatever it was, the lovers of surfboarding should be grateful to them. Another typically Hawaiian sport is riding the waves in outrigger canoes. Few people know that these canoes are the same type as those used by the ancient Hawaiians of a thousand years ago to cross the 2,000 miles of open ocean from Tahiti, their old home in the Society Islands. Today's easy access to the islands only emphasizes the skill and daring of those ancient mariners. Before long, we begin to realize that Hawaii is not just something we have read about. There really are coconut trees here, and men still climb them. In fact, long years ago, the coconut was one of the main foods used by these people. It grew the year around and always provided an easy meal. They grew to love what is called poi, the starchy paste made from taro root. And loving the fragrance and beauty of the flowers developed the charming custom of making lays as tokens of affection. The Hawaiians born with the sound of the surf in their ears have long been excellent swimmers, sailors, and fishermen. This fellow is using a throw net to catch fish the way Hawaiians used to catch them. It's a large circular net with weights attached to the edges. When it's thrown correctly, it fans out and drops on the fish, trapping them between the net and shore bottom. It's a clever method and served well back in the days when the Hawaiian to feed his family and himself. But today's huge demand makes this method impractical. These convict fish, or sergeant majors, are but one type of hundreds of unfamiliar and tropical fish found in the waters surrounding the islands. The fruits are tropical and strange until we try eating them as part of an Hawaiian feast, a luau. In the old days, a luau was the gathering of family and friends for a large meal followed by stories and ceremonial dances. Since these people didn't keep a written record of their history, they wove the stories of their forefathers into dances and thus passed them on to future generations.
The familiar hula dance is an excellent example of storytelling. Each movement of the hands, feet, and body conveys certain words. When the dance is completed, these words have told another story of the mythology and folklore of a Polynesian people. Our interest in Hawaii begins to take a new turn. A sword dance brought to the islands from Samoa long ago is not just an interesting oddity, but part of the history and culture of people who are now American. People from still other lands, such as these Koreans, have made Hawaii their home and have brought with them their ancient cultures. They take pride in preserving the costumes, dances, and customs of their forefathers. A young Chinese parades in a headgear symbolic of his heritage. The Portuguese proudly sing of their homeland. And the Filipinos preserve old folk dances. Yet they are all Americans, voting citizens of the United States. The heritage of the Hawaiians is particularly important. A statue of King Kamehameha reminds us that Hawaiian kings ruled these islands for centuries before European explorers arrived. The flag that flies above the royal palace is not a foreign flag. It was designed by an Englishman for King Kamehameha the Great. But the royal palace now houses executive offices of a democracy. And the throne room is now used for legislative meetings. The military barracks of the old monarchy are as far out of date compared to present facilities as is this ancient cannon to our defenses of today. The city of Honolulu has changed a lot since the days of monarchy and kings. Once, it was just the age of a simple island people. Now it is cosmopolitan, modern, and yet it has had to conform itself to its environment, the semi-tropics. Flowering trees, like the Poinciana, keep reminding us that this land is still Hawaiian. The blossoms of the shower tree are part of the tropical beauty which captivates us as visitors. Plumeria and other flowering trees distract us from realizing that this country is now part of the United States. The fruit of the mango tree has a flavor truly tropical. The papaya is a fruit with a sweetness you'll find excitingly different. As we move outside the city, we cross the beautiful Polly, and further up the coast, we enter the sugarcane country. This disking machine is but one of many modern mechanical devices used to prepare soil for the planting of sugarcane. This rich, deep volcanic soil combined with ideal climate and rainfall conditions allow a million tons of raw sugar to be produced each year. It takes almost two years for sugarcane to reach full maturity. During all this time, it is carefully kept free from insects and disease it is also irrigated and cultivated to the fullest extent. When the cane begins to tassel, it's close to harvest time. The first step in harvesting is burning the dead, dry leaves. It seems strange to deliberately set a crop afire, but since the moisture in the cane stalks prevents them from being harmed, this fire clears away only the useless debris in the field. Then, the sugar-filled stalks are ready to be gathered up and sent to the mill. This large cane rake is another specially designed mechanical wonder that eliminates the back-breaking task of cutting and stacking cane by hand. All the use of derricks, large trucks, and other huge machinery frees labor for more important tasks and at the same time lowers the cost of sugar per pound. The trucks and trains bring the cane to the mills. Here, the juice from the stalks is extracted, concentrated into raw sugar, and shipped to the mainland for refining into the sugar we use. 
Another large industry in Hawaii is the growing of pineapples. Before the field is planted, strips of heavy paper are laid down. This protects the young plants by discouraging weeds and by conserving the moisture in the soil. Tens of millions of these tiny pineapple plants are set out each year. It takes almost two years for a pineapple crop to mature, and during all that time, it must be guarded against the ravages of disease, soil deficiency, and insects. Machines like this sprayer are a wonderful aid. With them, they not only spray to prevent disease, but can also spray mineral solutions which the plants absorb through their leaves. When the battle of successful growth has been won, the job of harvesting the pineapples begins. They are picked by hand and tossed onto a long belt of the harvesting machine. Since pineapples must be harvested at just the right stage of development, these machines often go day and night to get them into the cannery at just the right time. Once they've been washed and sorted, they enter the Janaka machine, in which the pineapple is peeled, cut to perfect outside measurements, and cored. The part between the peel and the measurement to fit the cans is used as crushed pineapple. Meanwhile, the cored and trimmed pineapples are again inspected and sent to the slicing machine. From there, they go to deft operators who place just the right number of slices in each can. Over 20 million of these cans of pineapples are consumed by the United States each year. With a final inspection, the cans begin the last stage of the operation. They are capped and ready to be shipped. We are now getting better acquainted with the islands, and we move from Oahu to the biggest of them all, Hawaii. The big island is larger than all the others combined. It is 90 miles long and 75 wide. Hilo is the principal city. Along the windward side, called the Hamakua Coast, the cliffs of the shoreline, and the deep green valleys are marvelously beautiful. But the leeward side of the island is almost a desert. It is given over to ranges for cattle, which were introduced by Captain Vancouver. Cactus grows widely and gives some moisture to the cattle who strip the spines and chew the leaves. As we swing around the island past Mount Hualalai, we come to another cattle region, the verdant Kona Coast. Cowboys in Hawaii are called Paniolas, after the Mexican Espanolas who first rode these ranges. At the town of Kailua, the cattle are started on their way to market in a most unusual way. As we see, the cattle are swum out into the ocean and delivered to a small boat. Their heads are tied up out of the water and then they are towed through the harbor to a waiting cattle ship. They are then hoisted out of the sea and swung into pens. Cattle raising is a big industry here and supplies most of Hawaii's own needs in meat. By now, we find ourselves beginning to feel at home in Hawaii. Here on an island where King Kamehameha once ruled, and along this Kona coast where Captain Cook landed in 1779, we discover another industry. This is where the famous Kona coffee is grown. 
When the berries have become bright red, they're ready for picking. Because only the ripe ones can be used, they must be hand-picked. This boy is careful to choose only the ripe berries, because too many of the green ones would spoil the finished flavor. Since coffee in this whole district ripens at the same time, and since it is such a tremendous job to pick it carefully, the schools along the Kona Coast declare a holiday during the harvest time so that all the boys and girls can help the men strip the coffee trees on schedule. Kona coffee has become the third largest agricultural product of Hawaii. After picking, the coffee is sent to various mills to be processed. The beans are cured by being spread out over huge flat floors to dry in the sun. They are turned over again and again to ensure uniform dryness. Because of its unique flavor, Kona coffee is highly prized by blenders of America's finest coffees. The scenic beauty of grass and trees growing over the rhythmical formations of lava remind us that volcanoes are still occasionally active in Hawaii. Trucks pass over temporary roads cut through lava barely cooled from a recent eruption. Visitors are awed by the destructive possibilities of these mighty forces. The beautiful but harmless steam vents near Kilauea and the fascinating fern forests that thrive in the cone of an extinct volcano attract thousands of tourists each year. It's hard to believe that this wonderland of today was once a roaring, throbbing volcano. Yet every island in Hawaii owes its existence to huge volcanoes of the past. The islands of Hawaii are but the end of a chain of volcanoes that extend for 1,700 miles toward Japan. Hawaii is actually a series of broad-based mountains whose small tips only rise above the water to form the islands. These mountains were formed through the ages by layers of lava or magma pouring down their sides. At the top of Kilauea, with its relatively small fire pit called Halemaumau, is but one type of volcano. Periodically, it erupts, giving visitors an ideal chance to get a close view of a volcano in action. By most standards, this is a small eruption. If, however, Kilauea were to erupt with its former fury, the fire pit of Halemaumau would be lost in a sea of molten lava over two miles in diameter. Haleakala provides an excellent example of the size some of these volcanoes obtained. This awesome crater is over seven miles long and three miles wide. From an elevation of 10,000 feet, we look down upon the cinder cone floor of an extinct volcano that created most of the island of Maui. The eruption of Mauna Loa in 1950 presented quite another type of volcano. Here, the lava, forced by tremendous pressure of hot gases, split a long fissure in the side of the mountain. The molten lava then flowed down the side of the mountain, covering everything in its path to the sea. With the approach of night, the tremendous 600-foot-high gushes of lava are more easily distinguished. We can also see how the layers of lava were laid one on another by countless eruptions of the past to give us these mountains. Here we reach a new appreciation of the origin of these islands, just as we have gained a better understanding of the people and their way of life. We've come to know better this part of the United States, Hawaii, USA.